Boom! We are live! Hey, how is it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward here, for another live video Q&A on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. And the way that these video chats work is every Friday afternoon, I host a live Q&A specifically geared towards building muscle, losing fat, and getting in your best shape. So if you have any questions or topics of discussion that you would like to discuss with regards to that, Feel free to post those in our video chat there now. I'm just getting things set up on my end. Let's give me a minute here. Here we go. Try and organize this. I'm, I'm running a few minutes later than normal. I had to pick up my son from daycare today. and I had some uh, coaching calls that went a bit late. So running a couple minutes late. But hey, regardless, we're going to make this show a go. We're going to keep this thing going. All right, guys. So... If you are just tuning in or if you're brand new to the video chats, I want to welcome you. This is something that I do on a regular basis. Every Friday afternoon around 4 p.m. Eastern Time, I host a live video Q&A here on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. And it's all geared uh, towards building muscle, losing fat, and basically getting yourself back in shape again. So if you don't want to be fat and out of shape, you're sick and tired of starting over all over again, and you basically want some realistic action plans and strategies to help you move forwards to reaching your fitness and fat loss goals, then you are in the right place. Uh, I want to, first off, uh, welcome you if you're brand new. If, if you, In fact, if you're brand new, let me know in the comments there, in the chat window, let me know if you are new to the video chat. Just type in uh, the letter N if you are new and this is your first time tuning in to one of these video chats. And if you're a regular and you tune into these on a regular basis, type in the letter R. Let me know. So uh, I have just want to give you a heads up now on, on some of the things that I've been uh, working on over the past week. Uh, my father and I, we have been shooting a brand new workout series. If you've been following me on Facebook, you've probably seen some of the pictures. Um, what we're doing right now is we're putting together a brand new Get Back in Shape video series. And I've been doing the videos with my father. He's 69 years old, and he's in that category. He wants to get himself back in shape again. So I've been taking him through a new workout series. And uh, this is basically geared towards um, people who are either getting back to the gym, uh, you know, or starting off brand new. Or for that matter, even if you are, are more advanced and you're looking to change things up, you can still follow these workouts. Like the same basic principles apply. And of course, you can make the workouts as easy or as hard as you want based on how, how hard you push yourself. But the exercises we chose are good for people who are in that beginner intermediate phase. It's nothing too crazy, nothing too complex. Like if you have any uh, you know, injuries or mobility issues, the exercises are fairly easy to learn. And that's the purpose of it. We want to kind of provide a realistic and practical action plan for you to follow. So it's a three day per week uh, workout routine, focusing on total body exercises, but each time we train, we're doing different exercises for the total body. So there's a lot of training variety over the course of the week, and you're also getting the frequency in there as well, which is something I mentioned in a previous video. I actually touched on this last week in their live chat, and I made a separate video about it, uh, you know, workout frequency. So if you haven't checked that one out, then go back to the... Uh, you know, on my main YouTube channel page there, and you can check out that one where I really dive into the pros and cons of training frequency because that's a common question that a lot of people have. Like, how often should you be working out? You know, once a week, twice a week, three times a week. Like, how often should you work each major muscle group? And I went into detail and talked about that one. So without further ado, I'm just going to start jumping in and answering some questions. We've got several people tuning in, some things coming through. So who do we have joining us? We have... Uh, Jersey's is joining us. Jersey's chosen one. Chris, Andreas, Christopher, Fit Foodie. Someone says they're new to the channel. Welcome. If you're brand new, it's always nice to have new people joining in, joining the Total Fitness Bodybuilding community. Uh, Jason tuning in again. Thanks for what you're doing. Keep it up. Awesome. All right, let's see what else. And again, the way these chats work is I'm just going to be hanging out here for the next hour, and we're just going to basically have a conversation, hang out, shoot the breeze. And uh, if you have any questions related to building muscle, losing fat, your workouts, your nutrition, uh, you have any you know strategies that you want to discuss, any challenges you're dealing with, feel free to uh, type those into our chat window, and I'll do the best that I can to help you out over the course of the next hour. All right. 
I'm all out of coffee, but what odds? All right, last sip, done. Uh, okay, we have The Experiment ASD saying, Hey, coach, I hope I am early. I uh, have a huge problem with muscle recovery. I get sore three days after working out, so it's really difficult to hit different muscle groups when half my body is sore. All right, that's a, a common issue that a lot of people deal with, muscle soreness. So let's really dive in deep to muscle soreness. First off, you don't have to get sore to make progress. I mean, if you do, there's nothing wrong with it, as long as it is muscle soreness and not an injury, and there is a difference. Like, muscle soreness is usually that dull, achy feeling that you get in a muscle after you've provided a good workout. So the next day, like if, if you trained your chest, you know, your chest might be feeling sore and a bit achy. Um, but it, it's it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? I mean, it's just you get that delayed onset muscle soreness. Now, if you have a really sharp shooting pain, that's usually the sign of an injury, right? Injuries usually come about when you've pulled or strained or, or caused more damage than, than just regular muscle soreness. But the idea of getting sore, that, I mean, that's that's pretty common. And the way it usually works is the people who get sore the most are usually people who are new to working out, who are deconditioned, and that's when most soreness occurs. So if you're brand new to working out or you're coming back to the gym after a layoff or you just haven't been as consistent as you like, that's typically when you're going to get the most muscle soreness. Uh, the good news is the more often you train and the more consistent you are, the less muscle soreness you're going to experience because your body is built up its work capacity. It's built up its conditioning to handle the, the training and you're not going to get as much soreness. So in my case, like I'm very consistent with my workouts, like pretty much bang on three to four days a week. I'm in the gym working out consistently week in, week out regularly. So I don't experience a whole lot of muscle soreness anymore. And that's a nice thing. That's something you can actually look forward to because let's face it, nobody wants to be painfully sore all the time because it can be a bit of a, a nuisance, right? I mean, you're like, like, nobody wants to have that. Nobody wants to feel pain, right? And you don't have to feel pain, which is a good thing. But if you do experience it from time to time, it's not necessarily bad. It usually just means you've provided the muscles with a really good workout and did something that's probably not accustomed to. Now, when it comes to dealing with that muscle soreness, right? Um, th there's several strategies that you can uh, implement here. One that I find is, is beneficial, is, especially if you're experiencing it a lot, is, is just scale back the intensity of your training a little bit, or even scale back the volume just a little bit to kind of let your body build up gradually. You know, th there's no rush when it comes to working out in terms of like, you got to get in shape like as soon as possible or you got to go in there and destroy the muscles and you know really push yourself hardcore like you don't have to do that you it's okay to go in and do an easier workout and then build it up progressively and build it up gradually over time and, and this is something that i really encourage especially for people who are new to the gym coming back after a layoff or if you're getting a bit older like if you're over 40 you kind of have to respect your body a bit more. It just can't handle the same wear and tear and abuse that it did when it was younger, right? Like you, you see guys who are in their teens and their 20s, they can recover a lot faster and, and handle more intense workouts and get away with it. Whereas when you get older, over 40, over 50, over 60, uh, you have to respect your body more, right? It's just not going to, the, the recovery is not there like it used to be when you were younger. So if in, in your situation, there's a couple things you can do. Uh, one, like I say, is just scale back either, either scale back the intensity in terms of not pushing yourself as hard or scale back on the volume of sets you're doing. Like, I really don't know exactly what it is you're doing. I mean, if, if you would like to kind of like discuss this with me and then, you know, plan out a realistic strategy that works for you, then you can always email me and we can discuss this offline or, or in private, I should say. It's, it's still online, but you know what I mean? Like in private and come up with a realistic action plan that's right for you. And uh, my email address is leeh at leehayward.com. Just shoot me an email and I'll do my best that I can to help you out. But um, that's one thing that you can do. Another thing that helps a lot is after your workouts, you can do some post-workout cardio. So take 10 or even 20 minutes after your workouts to just do some, some low intensity cardio. And what that's going to do is is increase blood flow and circulation and help to get rid of some of that lactic acid buildup in the muscles, which often causes muscle soreness. So that can help you afterwards. Stretching out the body parts that you just trained is another good way to help reduce muscle soreness. 
And another strategy you can do as well, especially when you're like getting a shower afterwards, is you can use what's known as hot and cold therapy. So alternating hot and cold showers, uh, if you have access to like a hot tub or a cold shower, um, like a hot tub or, or, or a cold swimming pool works as well, but the, everybody has access to a shower. So all you have to do is when you're getting your shower, flip it to as hot as you can comfortably stand for about a minute or two, and then flip it to as cold as you can comfortably stand for about a minute and just alternate. So usually most people tend to go a little bit longer in the hot than they do in the cold, but you want to, you want the contrast, the contrast of hot and cold. And this is a great way to reduce muscle soreness. And the reason this works is because the, the alternating temperatures between the hot and cold actually helps to circulate blood flow throughout the body without you physically doing anything. When you have that hot water and your body is warm, it flushes blood to the surface. That's why if, if you're in a hot shower, your skin tends to get red because the blood is being forced to the surface of the skin. And then when you have the cold shower, it pulls blood to the core. So you're circulating blood throughout the body and helping to aid with the recovery process and you're not physically doing anything. So it's, it's just a nice way to uh, reduce some of that soreness. And this strategy is, is a proven strategy. It really does work, this hot and cold therapy. So it, it, ideally you wanna really try and target the muscles that are sore. So if your back is really sore, like really try and target the, the hot and cold on your back. If your chest is really sore, try and target hot and cold on your chest or your legs or wherever. And this is something I do myself from time to time, and I find it very helpful. So it's so a couple of tips that you can uh, certainly implement into your routine. And uh, again, if, if you want to chat about it in more detail and kind of like, you know, discuss your workouts or your nutrition or whatever, hey, shoot me an email, leeh at leehayward.com, and we can just discuss a realistic action plan and come up with some strategies that work for you and your situation. But those tips can get you moving in the right direction. Who else do we have joining in? Blue Leaf 1717. Lee, can you build an appeasing physique working out mainly machines instead of free weights? Yeah. I know a lot of people say, you know, free weights are superior to machines, and I like using both. And there's advantages to both. With machines, you have a lot of variety. They're safe and they're easy to learn for the most part. And you can certainly means is, is you got so much variety because when it comes to lifting free weights, yes, that's great. And, and the idea behind free weights and the benefits of it is when you're lifting real weight, it, it's more of a, a functional three-dimensional lift because you have to balance and support and stabilize the weight when you're lifting a machine. The machine is balancing and supporting and stabilizing and you simply have to push or pull against resistance. So you don't get the same stabilization aspect when you're doing a machine exercise, but you're still stimulating the muscle. You're still providing with it with resistance and still has to train and, and overcome that resistance. So th that's one of the, the, I guess, pros of free weights is you get more balance and stabilization and that real world functional strength. But you're kind of limited because with free weights, you, you only have, you can lift against gravity. Like you can only lift the weights up and down. Whereas with machines, you can use different ranges of motion, different angles. Like for example, a lat pull down. You can't duplicate that with a free weight exercise unless you're somehow hanging upside down or whatever. Like there's certain things you can't do with free weights, right? That's where cables and machines really have an advantage because now you can have resistance horizontally or you can have resistance pulling down vertically or you can do uh, like a leg extension machine or you can do a leg curl machine or uh, uh, like a leg press or different exercise variations that you don't have access to with free weights. So it's not that one is better or worse or right or wrong, good or bad, any of that stuff. It's, it's all these have, have benefits. And usually when I'm starting a beginner, I, I usually have them do primarily machine exercises because it's the easiest way to get into the gym, to work out, and it's safe because where you don't have to balance and support it, there's less risk of injury. There's less risk of you screwing up machine exercise than there is with a free weight. Like if we're doing a machine chest press, you know, you're doing the exercise. If you hit failure, like, okay, you just rack the weight, you know, you rest the weight back down on the machine and then there's no, you're not really in any danger. Whereas if you're doing like a barbell bench press and you hit failure or whatever, now you have a, a barbell, you know, 
stapled across your chest and you could be in trouble and you had to balance and stabilize yourself more so it the machine or sorry the free weights are a more advanced variation so as you get more advanced with your workouts you can kind of when possible do the free weight variations like a free weight bench press or a free weight row free weight overhead press free weight squats and things like that but for someone just getting started uh, machines are fine like the, the bottom line is is training consistently training with progressive overload and just again the most important thing is the consistency actually showing up and doing it on a regular basis so that you're building that habit and actually providing that muscle stimulation so that your body has a chance to adapt and grow and respond and according to it but yeah by all means you can still get great progress using machines okay who else we got lee dunnigan is joining he says i listen every week and i've picked up a lot of great tips keep up the good work i appreciate the support and uh glad you enjoy the video chats that's what it's all about i mean hey if you're benefiting from it uh, then that's 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 good news for me right that's the whole purpose of this we have jason tuning in he says thanks for your knowledge on bodybuilding i've got a question should i be lifting as heavy as possible doing less reps to get big gains heavy is relative like what's heavy for you may not be heavy for someone else and vice versa it's it's all relative so yes you should be lifting heavy but heavy for you right and, and th this is where it can get a bit confusing because a lot of people are, are judging themselves based on what other people are doing like if you go into the gym and you see some advanced bodybuilder or power lifter and he's bench pressing three plates aside on the bench press machine or the the you know the the barbell bench press and he's you know three plates aside and you're looking whoa well i'm only lifting one plate aside like you know maybe i should be lifting heavy like him well if you can't physically do it then no i mean you know maybe one plate per side is heavy for you so it's all relative like don't get hung up on what what other people are doing it's all personal to you now what i would recommend is for for a beginner or intermediate strive for 10 repetitions per set like if you can't get 10 repetitions with good form the weight's too heavy especially at the beginning stages now as you get more advanced and if your goal is strength and building power then you can experiment with uh, lower repetition ranges but in the initial phase we want to learn the exercise we want to build those positive habits and of course we want to stay injury free like that's huge so lighter weights where you can actually lift at least 10 good repetitions per set and what I mean good repetitions is repetitions with good form where you are in control of the weight. You're not swinging or heaving or jerking the weight up. As long as you can do that, then you're moving in the right direction. And don't force it. Like a lot of people, like we hear, okay, you should be training with progressive overload and you should be trying to increase the weights. And that's true, but don't force the process. Like when you're doing an exercise, let's just say we're starting off and we want to do sets of 10 repetitions. When you get to the point where that 10 reps feels really easy and you can do way more than 10 reps, then increase the weight for your next workout and increase in small increments, like a five pound jump or, or the next weight on the weight stack, you know, the, the next pin on the weight stack, just go by small, small increments. And the smaller the increment, the better. I would much rather you make smaller, more frequent jumps in weight rather than trying to make a big jump in weight. And that's a common mistake that you see a lot of uh, new lifters making is they try and increase the weight too much too soon. So when, when I'm in the gym, like if I'm increasing the weight on a barbell exercise, I use those little two and a half pound plates and I just go up one on each side so I increase the weight by five pounds. Doesn't sound like much, but little five pound jumps in weight add up over time. And even these days, you know, a lot of gyms might even have the smaller fractional weight plates, which allow you to increase even lighter. I know at the platinum health and fitness where i train they have the small weight plates uh, i think they even have them as light as a quarter pound so like you could literally put a quarter pound on each side of the barbell and go up by half a pound so that's even better for some smaller exercises like if you can't make that full five pound jump which depending on the exercise might be a big jump then maybe you can just go up by like half a pound or even one pound i mean th that's still progressive overload because just Think of it in the bigger picture. Like, let's just say you were doing the bench press and you were able to add just one pound per week to your bench press. Well, over the course of the year, you just add 50 pounds to your bench press, which is a significant you know, amount to, to increase it by. And so think of small, frequent jumps, not trying to do these big, massive jumps. Like, I, I see it all the time. Like, people are, 
maybe you know they're they're bench pressing a, a hundred pounds and they say well i want to go up and then they put you know a, a 10 pounds on each side now they're increasing by you know 120 pounds well that might be too big of a jump right? i mean that's that's a 20 percent jump which is huge right i would much rather you go up by like say five pounds have a five percent increase or even less and, and just make those jumps in weight more frequently and the good thing about these smaller frequent jumps in weight is there's less risk of injury so you're still providing that progressive overload getting the benefits of, of strength training, but less risk of injury. And, and this is something I really want to drive home, and I, I keep driving this home, is you need to be uh, smart about it. You need to stay injury-free or at least do the best you can. I mean, of course, sometimes shit happens, right? And you, you get hurt for even though you're doing everything right. I mean, sometimes that does happen from time to time. But you want to take all the precautions you can to remain injury-free. That is huge, right? So... Uh, I don't know, I'm kind of going all over the place there. But bottom line, when, when it comes to uh, lifting heavy, no, you don't need to to lift heavy to get big, right? Like, again, heavy is, is relative to the individual, but lift heavy for you. Uh, where else we too? All right. First Revenge is joining in. He says, what is your take on bulking? I hear it's a myth and some people, I hear it's a myth and then some people swear by it. Can you build muscle on a calorie deficit or a maintenance calorie intake? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to kind of try and dispel the whole myths and misconceptions with bulking. You can absolutely build lean muscle while simultaneously burning body fat. That's absolutely possible, and most people do. Uh, all my personal coaching students that I'm working with um, I would actually, literally all of them, I'm just thinking about everybody now that I'm working with personally right now, they all want to burn body fat as one of their primary goals. And while they're doing that, we're also having them simultaneously work on building muscle in the process. And you can absolutely do that. The thing is, you need to look at the bigger picture. If you're consistent with your workouts, consistent with the weight training, that's going to stimulate muscle growth and you can build lean muscle as long as you're fueling your body with the proper nutrients. So getting adequate protein to help build and repair that muscle tissue, getting adequate fruits and vegetables to provide uh, you know, the vitamins and the minerals and the fiber and the, the phytonutrients and the, mac or the micronutrients as well as the macronutrients. As long as you're providing adequate nutrition, your body can still build muscle in a deficit because it can utilize the stored body fat for energy, right? So it's, it's very common to see someone like lose 10 pounds of body fat and gain, you know, two to three pounds of lean muscle in the process. That is very noticeable and very possible, especially for someone who's resuming training af after a layoff or someone who's brand new. Now, of course, the more advanced you get in your workouts, the harder it is to build new muscle tissue, right? Usually the way it works is like each year of training, uh, of consistent training, the harder it's going to be to build lean muscle. So for someone who's been working out consistently week in, week out for, for like 10 years, like the amount of new muscle they're going to gain after 10 years is going to be very low. I'm not saying that it's impossible to gain new muscle, but it's, it's, it's not going to be like someone in their first year. Right. So, I mean, it, every year of training thereafter and the closer you the better shape you get in and the closer to your genetic potential, the harder it's going to be to continue to make progress. But you can still do it and you don't need to bulk up to because bulking up is usually a, 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 a nice way of saying getting fat. Right. Like that's usually what happens when people bulk up and they just start slamming back all kinds of excess calories, especially if it's junk calories. You know, you're eating a lot of just high calorie dense foods. Uh, a lot of times what's happening is, yeah, you gain weight. And sometimes people mistake that weight as muscle, but it's it's not actual muscle tissue. I mean, yes, okay, you're going to fill up your glycogen stores. You're going to feel a bit stronger because, I mean, if, if you got some extra weight on and you're eating a lot, you typically do feel stronger. And that's why you see like a lot of strongman competitors or powerlifters. I mean, very often will eat a lot of food to, to increase their strength. But as far as actual building lean muscle tissue, uh, you, 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 it's, it's kind of overrated because what ends up happening is you end up gaining so much more body fat than muscle. And then when it comes time to cut and lose that body fat, very often you end up sacrificing a lot of the muscle you gained while bulking in the process, especially if you go on some of these crazy crash diet types of approaches. 
So I would rather see someone make a slow, steady, uh, lean muscle gains versus going through this whole bulking, cutting type of routine. Like, I'm not a big fan of, of bulking unless you are an extremely skinny person with a, a fast metabolism. Like, you know, the the stereotypical 98-pound weakling, right, you know, who's, who just, like, wants to put meat on their bones. Okay, in a situation like that, yeah, you consume a high-calorie diet and just try and fill out your frame. You know, skinny teenagers, skinny ectomorphs, people who are just naturally skinny and struggling to put on weight in those situations yeah purposely consuming a high calorie diet eating more calorie dense foods makes sense but if you've got extra body fat like if, if you look down and you see your belly and you got a roll of belly fat you don't want to be slamming back high calorie foods even if you're skinny like the the skinny fat syndrome you don't want to just purposely eat more high calorie foods because you're just going to get fatter in the process we want to burn that fat while building muscle simultaneously and you can absolutely do that with the right combination of training, nutrition, and proper lifestyle habits. And again, that's what I really focus on when, when I'm working with my coaching students is combining all that stuff, combining the training, combining the cardio, the nutrition, and most importantly, the lifestyle. Because like, let's face it, like you don't need more how-to information. There's enough how-to information out there. It's how do you take that information and actually apply it to you, your lifestyle, your situation, and make it work? That's the hard part. That's where I end up coaching people with uh, because that's the challenge. Like you don't need another workout plan. Like you can go on YouTube right now and so type in workout. Boom. You, you get thousands of videos, workouts. Boom. So there's, you have it all, like all the workouts there are. Boom. It's already on YouTube. Like uh, diets. You can type in diet. Boom. All the diets are already there. Right. So, I mean, lack of information is not the reason you're overweight and out of shape, <laughs> right? It's it's how do you take that information and apply it and make it work for you? And, and even taking it to another level, how do you filter out that information and realize what's applicable to you and your situation? Because one of the things that we suffer from now is information overload. There's just so much information. And then so many people are coming up with saying, you know, you have to do this and you have to do that. And it's not necessarily right or wrong. Like what they're saying may be true and may be accurate for a certain person or a certain demographic. Like if, if, if I was talking to a competitive bodybuilder, the type of diet and training that I would recommend for a bodybuilder who's trying to go from lean to contest ripped or shredded, whatever word you want to use, is totally different than someone who's, you know, say like someone who's over 40, uh, trying to get back into the gym, lose the gut and get back in shape. Right. Like it's, it's a different scenario, different situation. And, and totally it's not that one information is right or wrong. It's just what's applicable to you at this stage. And to kind of give you an analogy, like let's look at the education system. Right. Uh, like school. Like if you take what you would teach someone in elementary school. Right. Basic math, like addition and subtraction and, you know, learning the alphabet and, and, and just simple, you know, things like that versus someone who's in university, right? And, and they're learning more complicated things, you know, calculus and algebra and chemistry and, you know, science and whatever. Like, you wouldn't be able to teach, uh, you know, a, a kindergarten student uh, calculus. Like, they, 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 what the heck are you talking about? Like, I don't even know how to count to 10 yet, right? I'm still learning my ABCs and how to add, like, 1 plus 1 equals 2. They're, they're at that level. Whereas calculus and algebra is at a totally different level. It's not that one is right or wrong, good or bad. It's just who's the level that it's for, right? The same applies with fitness information. Who's it for? And, and this is where a lot of confusion comes about because people might be watching a video that's geared towards like a bodybuilder or geared towards a powerlifter or geared towards an athlete or, or someone who's been more advanced in their training and maybe they're just starting out. And then they're saying, well, I'm going to, I want to look like that guy. I want to look like that you know, competitive bodybuilder or that fitness model, you know, okay, he's been training for 15 years. I want to look like him. So I'm going to do what he does, but he's so further advanced that you're not ready for that yet. Just like that kindergarten student is not ready for algebra until they can do basic math and addition, subtraction. And then of course, multiplication and division that like you have to take it in steps. And this is where it gets so confusing. This is where so many people screw up is because they're following something that's not applicable to them in their situation. And, and one of the, the things that I find a lot of times is people are trying to accumulate more and more knowledge. So they're watching videos and they're reading, 
you know, following fitness influencers on social media and they're reading books and, and, and articles and all this and they're just getting all this information and they're just becoming overwhelmed with it. Whereas like information and, and just accumulating knowledge, okay, that's good. But true wisdom is not accumulation. True wisdom is elimination. It's like cutting out all the crap that you don't need and just focusing on those few special things that you do need. The few things that are applicable to you, your situation right now. What's going to move the needle right now at this stage of the game? That's where most people struggle is because they're so bombarded with everything. We just kind of like, you know, forget all that other stuff. Here's a few little things. This is what you need to do when you go to the gym. These are the foods you need to eat. This is what you need to do. You know, this is how you need to adjust your lifestyle. Just boom, boom, boom. Focus on these few things and forget everything else. Don't get overwhelmed with it all, right? And, and that's what I focus on when I'm coaching people is just to cut out the clutter and really eliminate it. Eliminate the complexity and focus on a few simple things. And then once people master those few simple things, master the basics... Boom, they, they start changing, like they start losing fat, they start building muscle, they start feeling better, and they start seeing results and versus just being overwhelmed and confused and then, you know, information overload and then getting that paralysis by analysis situation, which so many people fall into these days. All right, let's move on. What else we got there? Uh, Chris is joining. What do pyramids do for muscle building? How should I use them? Pyramid sets. Uh, it's it's a complicated way of saying just increase the weight with each set. That's, that's all it is. I mean, it's, it's not complicated, I suppose. But the whole idea of a pyramid, there, there's there's different ways of going about it. But bottom line, it's just you start off with a light weight, right? Do an easy, light set. And most you should always use pyramids in your workouts because you should start with a light warm-up set. Do that first. Then increase the weight. Do a, a, a progressively heavier warm-up set. And then do another progressively heavier warm-up set and gradually build your way up to your top weight working set. Now, depending on the exercise, depending on your strength and your fitness level is going to determine how many sets you need, right? A beginner is not going to need as many sets as a more advanced person. Like a beginner who can bench press 100 pounds versus an advanced power lifter or bodybuilder who can bench press 500 pounds. Like someone who can bench press 500 pounds is going to need way more warm-up sets to build up to that top weight versus someone who's can bench press say like 100 pounds they might start with a warm-up set of 50 then do another warm-up set with 75 and then go to their top weight of 100 and that might be fine whereas someone who's benching let's just say 500 they'll probably start off with say like 135 you know uh, 185 225 275 3 315 and work their way up gradually right so but again to, to answer your question pyramids all it is is starting off light and then pyramiding the weight up now, a lot of times people will also lower the repetitions. So they might do lightweight, high reps, and then with each set, they increase the weight and lower the reps a little bit, increase the weight, lower the reps a little bit. So if, if you were to map it out on a chart or a graph, it kind of has a shape of a pyramid to it. Then you can also do the reverse. You can actually come back down. So like once you work up to a peak, sometimes people like to come back down again. So they might, once they hit that top working weight set, then they might lighten the weight and do higher reps and then lighten the weight again and do even another set of, of higher reps. So that's where the true true pyramid comes when you have it like that but it's it's just all it is increasing the weight with each set that's the bottom line <laughs> start off light and work your way up uh we have baby boomer fitness tuning in how's it going saying thanks for the support you're welcome uh doug is joining us he says he's 49 years old and he feels like he has a good workout plan a good nutrition plan though he goes through periods of no motivation for a couple weeks at a time and he usually Usually consistent with daily workouts, five to seven days of any ideas. <sighs> okay, so you have a good workout, you have a good nutrition, you, you're consistent with five to seven days a week, but then you go through slumps of no motivation. That's pretty normal. Like, nobody's going to be, like, gun-ho excited, like, yeah, 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 rah, 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 full of piss and vinegar to go to the gym, like, all the time. We're going to go through ups and downs and slumps, and life's going to throw curveballs at you. Sometimes you're going to get busy with work or family responsibilities or, or whatever. Like, there, there's there's outside influences that's going to have an, inf, uh, an impact on your workouts. Um, there There's several ways that you can go about this. Um, one is try and kind of, like, schedule your workouts in advance and have them as, make it more of a habit 
than something you rely on with motivation. Like, just think of other things in your life, like going to work. Do you ever have days where you wake up and you don't want to go to work? Or if you're a student, have you ever had days where you wake up and not want to go to school? But did you do it anyway? Yeah, because it's what you do. That's how you make a living or that's, you know, you're, you're paying for your education or whatever. You, you, sometimes you just have to kind of like bite the bullet and do it anyway. So try to schedule your, your workouts in advance and have it so it's something that you stick to and you do even if you don't feel like it. If, if you're always relying on motivation, like, oh, I'll go to the gym if I'm excited and motivated to go and then I won't if I'm not. Well, that's that's like a roller coaster. I mean, there, there's no consistency with that. It's like saying, oh, I'll go to work if I feel like it, but I won't if I don't. Or I'll go to work if I have lots of energy today, but if, I, if I'm tired, I won't. Like, just, just imagine how... <laughs> How, how your boss would feel about it if, if, if you it only showed up when you were motivated to go to work, right? Sometimes you just have to do things. And, and what you very often find is the hardest part of going to the gym, it's not the exercises, it's it's not, you know, the, the, the workout, it's not even the effort that you have to exert. The hardest part is getting your ass out the door and into the gym. Once you're there, it kind of gets easier from there. So set the habit, set the appointment, kind of like make it a non-negotiable that you have to show up. Now, once you get there, if you don't feel like you, you, you're extra tired or, or whatever, then, okay, we'll do an easier workout that day. Like you can give yourself permission to do that, but still show up. And, and I do this myself. Like I'll, I'll have my workouts scheduled in advance and I will show up, but, you know, I kind of use my energy and, and how I'm feeling that day to determine how hard I push myself. But I always show up like if I'm really tired and I'm like, man, I just I'm tired. I'm sore. I don't have it in me today. Then I might just go in and do cardio. I might just show up at the gym and do nothing but just some low intensity cardio. But at least I'm getting that exercise. I'm still getting the health benefits of regular exercise. I'm still keeping with the habits, still keeping with the schedule, you know, still still reaping the benefits. Then on other days, if I'm feeling really good and I'm strong and I'm energetic, then hey, I'm going to push myself, you know, a hard, high intensity workout, you know, maybe some higher intensity cardio or whatever. But just you have to make it a habit. And if you can stack it on top of other things that you're already doing that are non-negotiable, then that makes it a lot easier. And like, I'll give you some examples. One of my coaching students, uh, Aaron, that I'm, I'm working with, uh, he works out every day on his lunch break. Right. So they, he's fortunate enough that at his place of work, they have a fitness center. So he goes into work. Right. I mean, like you, you go to work every day, whether you're motivated or not. So he's already at work. He has a lunch break every day. Right. You don't need to be motivated to have a lunch break. So he has it scheduled in, in such a way that he on his lunch break, he goes to the, the gym at his place of work and he works out every lunch break. Boom. So he does that five days a week. Right. That's consistent. That's any schedule. This habit is a non-negotiable. He does that no matter what. And you can try and do the same thing for you. Like, even if you don't have a gym at your place of work, well, maybe you want to work out after work. So you go to work, right? As soon as on your, you have your gym bag packed, ready to go. So on your way home from work in the afternoon, you stop into the gym, get your workout done before you come home. Like make it as, as kind of reduce the friction of getting your ass in the gym, because that is the hardest part. You have to kind of stack it on top of things that you're already doing and, and make it as easy as possible to get there. And even in, in my own situation, as, as not so much for me, but it's more for my wife, <laughs> my wife, Patricia. Uh, we, we set up a, a system in our own schedule to make it more easy for us to get to the gym together. So what we've done is we've set it up. So three days a week, our son Harvey goes to daycare. And the daycare that we take him to is literally next door to the gym. So we're already going to daycare to drop our son off. So Every, you know, three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we drop him off at daycare. As soon as he's dropped off and he's there, we go next door and we work out together. So that's three guaranteed workouts per week, non-negotiable. We're already there. We just have to, you know, walk next door and go into the gym. So anytime you can kind of reduce the friction, because it's it's that initial friction, it's the hardest part, right? Like if, if you say, okay, I want to work out after work. And then you go to work and you come home and then you plop your ass on the couch and you start, you flick on Netflix or you turn on, you know, you, you start scrolling through social media and then you're, you're on the couch and you're tired and you're like, 
oh, I don't feel motivated to go to the gym today. Oh, should I go? Should I not? You know, and then you're, you're watching Netflix and the next thing you know, you watch, I'll just watch one show. And then of course the second show automatically plays and they always leave you with a cliffhanger. So you're going to hang around and watch the next show. And before you know it, what, what was going to be a, uh, a dedicated go to the gym day ended up being a binge watching evening on the couch, watching Netflix, right? Cause you, you, you let that, you, you slid into that habit. Whereas if you had it set up where the gym bag was packed, ready to go in the back of your car. So as soon as you finished work for the day, instead of going home, you stopped into the gym first, got the workout in. Then when you come home, you can sit back and watch your shows on Netflix or whatever it is you want to do for the rest of the evening. But you have to set it, you have to schedule it and you have to stick to those habits and do it regardless if you want to or not. Right. Like just the same as you go to work regardless if you want to or not. Right. Because it's something you have to do. You kind of have to make the gym something you have to do. And the, the, the more you often you do it, then the easier it's going to be. And don't overthink it. Like, don't start, like, stop and ponder. Oh, do I want to go? Do I not want to go? Hmm, you know, just, just go. Like, literally, don't think. Just just do. When, when you start overthinking it, then you're more likely to start to come up with excuses not to go. Like, just, just stop thinking. Take the gym bag. Go. Have it packed, ready to go in advance. Like, oh, like, my gym bag's on the floor there, ready to go. I could grab it and head out the door right now. Right. It's, it's ready to go at a moment's notice. Make it as easy and frictionless as possible to do the good things. And then vice versa, you can use the opposite of this for some of the bad habits. Right. You can increase the friction for the bad habits. Now, this could be a long winded video that, that could be a whole video in and of itself. But ho hopefully that helps. I'm going to move on because I know we got a lot of other questions coming through. All right. Uh, who else is tuning in? We have Graz Maiden from the Netherlands. Welcome. Wow. Actually, ironically, I just have a new coaching student who uh, j joined from the Netherlands just recently. Interesting. Uh, Baby Boomer Fitness. Do you like shrugs or upright rows better for trap work? Seems rows recruit my traps more. It's it's personal preference. If you find... What was, what was it? Just a second. It disappeared on my screen. Uh, if you find the upright rows are better, then, hey, do the upright rows. It's not really a, one is right or wrong. It's just, hey, what works the best for you? I don't get hung up on exercises. Like, a, a, this is a question that I, I get a lot from my coaching students. Is people asking, you know, like, oh, well, what's the best exercise? Or, or I might have an exercise in, in their program initially. And when we're in that fine-tuning phases of trying to tweak it and figure out how their body responds, they might say, well, I don't like this exercise. I prefer this exercise or whatever. I said, that's fine. They, we can switch exercises. The main thing is working the muscle, right? Don't get hung up on the exercises. As long as you're working the muscle and you're stimulating it and you're training with progressive overload, then it doesn't matter. Like you don't have to do a certain exercise. Even if somebody, you know, your, your favorite fitness influencer or your favorite YouTuber, or whatever it says, I, you know, I love whatever. I love squats, for example. Let's just say somebody really loves squats, but you find squats, they just kill your knees, they hurt your back, you can't do it, you know, for whatever reason. You don't have to squat, right? You don't. There's other exercises. You can, there's oodles and oodles of exercises for every major muscle group. Like, you do not have to, to do one or the other. So, in the case of the traps, if you like shrugs, do shrugs. Uh, if, if you like upright rows, do upright rows, right? You, you can change it up and you can do barbell or dumbbell or, or whatever, like you, or, or cables. Like you, you can mix it up and do different variations. Don't get hung up on the exercise. Just focus on working the muscle, right? That's all that matters when it comes to getting in shape, you know, and improving your, your physique in terms of a, a building muscle and losing body fat. Now, of course, if you're a competitive athlete or like a power lifter, well, if you're a power lifter, you have to like squats, you have to like bench presses, or you have to like deadlifts, or you don't necessarily have to like them, but you have to do them, because that's what powerlifting is, right? If you don't squat, bench, and deadlift, then you're not a power lifter. But if you're just doing it for health, fitness, and to improve your, your physique and, and to get all those benefits, then you don't have to squat, bench, or deadlift. You can do other exercises to train those same muscles instead. So I don't have a a connection or, or, or anything with any exercise. It's kind of an individual thing, right? You do what works the best for you. And I encourage people to try different exercises and try different variations. And if and the ones that you like and the ones that work the best for you, then those are the ones that you want to incorporate in your routine. All right, we have Andreas is joining us. Navid is joining. Navid saying, what do you think of the epitome of roided bodybuilders 
physique as compared to the epitome of natural bodybuilders like Reg Park. Um, what do I think? It's 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 just bodybuilding is. I mean, I, honestly, I don't follow competitive bodybuilding much these days. It's it's not that I, I don't like it or whatever. It's just I'm not competing myself anymore, and I just kind of I'm more focused on bodybuilding in its true sense of building the body. You know, helping people to improve their health, their fitness, build muscle, lose fat, and and, and basically reap the the health and the the lifestyle and the, the just all the benefits that come from it right the, the longevity the confidence the strength the energy being able to live life without your body holding you back because i mean so many people these days they're they're in bodies that hold them back because they're so overweight or out of shape that they can't do the things that they want to do or they're dying young because they're so unhealthy like I'm in, I'm in the true sense of bodybuilding, as in building your body. That's what I focus on now, and not so much the competitive bodybuilding aspect. So since I stopped competing in bodybuilding, I'm not like on there following all the the bodybuilders, and I'm not, I'm not a bodybuilding fan as such, right? I mean, I, I still keep track of it to a degree because, I mean, heck, if, if you're in the fitness industry, it's going to be popping up, right? But I'm not a, like a hardcore following it and giving my predictions and placings and all that i mean i i, I couldn't care less anymore <laughs> but to answer the question about you know steroids versus natural it's it's just part of the sport it's part of all professional sports if you go to, in in professional sports regardless of what it is whether it's a baseball football bicycling right uh anything there there's there's performance enhancing drugs at all levels right so it's it's just part of it I mean, it, obviously, from the health perspective, if when people abuse performance enhancing drugs, that's not healthy. So, you know, it's, it helps to increase muscle mass and, and take things to the more extreme level. But from a health perspective, no, it, it's not. Um, so you really have to look at it from like wh whose perspective. I mean, in the case of a professional bodybuilder, if they have a shot at becoming the best in the world or, you know, turning pro or winning an Olympia or something like that, okay, maybe the risk to reward ratio is more in their favor and they're going to do that. But for the average person who just wants to look and feel better, no, it doesn't make sense. Right. You know, I mean, I would much rather be smaller and, and more normal, if you will. I mean, there's the average person doesn't want to look like a professional bodybuilder anyway. Right. Like it, 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 it just, it doesn't seem that way. Like you ask the average person on the street, Hey, would you like to be 250 pounds and jacked and shredded? And like, no, they just, they would rather be like a, a lean athletic 200 pounds or even less, right? Depending on, on their height and stuff. Like the average person doesn't want to be that huge stream mass monster of a bodybuilder. They just want a lean, healthy, athletic physique, one that looks good and feels good. And and that's that's what I'm after, right? I mean, like I'm lighter now than I've been in years, right? I'm, I'm 188 pounds in the morning when I wake up now. I mean, that's lighter than I've been in years. Even when... Like back in my early competition days, I mean, I used to be heavier than that sometimes on stage or, or, you know, but now I'm just lighter, leaner, and I feel good. And that's what it's all about, just feeling good and and being comfortable in my own skin. I, I don't have, and of course, I want to live a long time. So I'm going to do whatever I can to maximize my health. I'm not going to jeopardize it with, uh, you know, using performance enhancing drugs. But to, to each their own, right? It all depends on the situation. Like I was talking about earlier, right? Remember what I was saying? Like, you know, it's it's not necessarily right or wrong. It depends on the situation, you know. So at the professional bodybuilding level, it's kind of expected. Like, it's just like, you know, if, if you're looking at another, another analogy to give you, like, I'm a, a race, a amateur race car enthusiast. Like, I compete in, in uh, rally racing and autocross and I've done, you know, uh, professional driving schools and stuff like that so i'm a bit of a, a race nut you know that's a, a hobby of mine i mean if somebody has a race car the car is modified for the most part right it's going to have performance modifications right you know the exhaust is going to be done you know the suspension is going to be done the you know there, there, there's there's modifications done to the car right it's not a stock car like people don't expect to go on to a racetrack with a stock car they're going to modify it same in in high level bodybuilding right these guys are modified bodybuilders right they're not stock if you will right so it's it's not necessarily right or wrong it's just that's what's expected at the highest level all right where else are we to um 
Do you indulge? Okay, I don't think I missed any. Okay, Fit Foodie is asking, do you have cheat days on your diet? No, I don't have cheat days. I'm not an advocate of cheat days because a cheat day really sends the wrong message. And I'm going to share my personal experiences with this. Back when I... Um, Let me see here. I, I don't have it with me here. I was just referring to a book. Back in the day, the, 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 I think one of the most popular programs that really advocated cheat days and was a mass appeal program was the Body for Life by Bill Phillips. Now, I have massive respect for Bill Phillips because he's done a lot for the fitness industry. And I went through the Body for Life program and everything else. But one of the things he really encouraged back then was eat clean six days a week and then have one cheat day where you eat whatever you want. Now, it does work, right? You can make it work. But I find that it, it sets up bad eating habits because what would happen in my case and what happens in a lot of people's case is you go overboard on that cheat day and you try and make sure that you eat as much junk and crap as possible to get the most out of your cheat day. And a lot of people think that, oh, as long as I eat it on my cheat day, it doesn't matter or it's not going to have any impact. Well, guess what? Calories in versus calories out count. And I've seen a lot of guys and gals totally undo a full week of dieting with one massive cheat. Cheat day, that is. Like, let's just assume, for example, you're eating clean, you're exercising and everything else all week long, and you average a 500 per day calorie deficit. So at the end of six days of clean eating, you have 500 calorie deficit. So you're 300 or 3000 calorie deficit for the week. And then you say, well, today is my cheat day. Now I'm going to eat whatever I want. If you're eating high fat foods and high sugar foods and really calorie dense foods, you can easily go into a 3000 calorie surplus or more and actually cancel out an entire week's worth of fat loss with one cheat day. Right. I, I've done it. Like, I mean, to put things in perspective, like, um, if you ever looked at the calories, like on a, a typical pizza, like I'm the only ones you actually see calories on is the ones that you buy at the grocery store, but like a, one of those like average grocery store frozen pizzas, for example, if there's about 2000 calories in one of those pizzas, uh, again, depending on the size and whatever, but I, I'm just thinking like there's, there's one that I used to eat on my cheat, cheat days, uh, a delicio pizza right had 2000 calories if you added it all up i could easily eat that thing i could easily slam back that pizza and still want more so i mean just think if i ate that pizza and then i also had you know potato chips or i went out for a burger and fries or or i was eating ice cream and all like i could easily slam back 3000 plus calories and be you know in a surplus and cancel out the entire week's worth of dieting. And you see this all the time. Like a lot of people say, well, I'm I'm dieting, I'm eating right, I'm doing everything right, I'm doing cardio. Like, why am I not losing weight? And then when we break it down and they say, okay, well, I'm doing this, you know, six days a week, but then one day a week I have my cheat. And then they go nuts. You know, the all you can eat buffet and the, you know, the bacon and eggs for breakfast and burgers and fries and ice cream and cakes and cookies and whatever. Like it's it, it sets up bad eating habits for one. And uh, you can easily cancel out your entire week's worth of progress. So I would rather have cheat meals and moderate those cheat meals. And the more you do this, the less junk food you're actually going to need or crave. And what I've actually found for myself is when I eat clean and healthy and eat in such a way that I'm satisfying my hunger and filling up on the good nutrient dense foods, I actually don't crave the junk food nearly as much. And then when I do crave it, I don't need as much of it to satisfy those cravings. So how I have a cheat now is I usually save it for after a meal. So prime example, the other day was my father's birthday. Uh, he turned 69 this week and for his birthday, we, we had dinner and of course he had birthday cake. So for dinner that night we had, uh, I, I think it was, um, what, was what, what did we have for dinner? It was meat and vegetables and rice was the main course, right? So we filled up on the, on the meat and the veggies and, and the rice. That was the main course. And that was a good, healthy meal. And then we had some birthday cake for dessert. And I had a piece of cake. And I, I ate that cake. I enjoyed it. Didn't feel guilty about it. But, you know, I, okay, I had a slice of cake. I said, okay, I taste the chocolate cake. Mm, yeah, it's good. But, you know, it's big deal, right? I, I got the craving out of my system. Now I can move on. 
versus if you save it all up for a cheat day, a lot of times people have this mentality, like when cheat day rolls around, I got to wake up early and start eating and then I'm going to stay up late and I'm going to still eat. And you kind of have this mentality that you want to eat and eat and eat to make the most of your cheat day, right? It's almost like when you go to the all you can eat buffet, like you always are tempted to go back for more and more because you want to get your money's worth, right? So it's almost like when you have that cheat day, you almost like want to get your the best bang for your cheat day, if you will. And you try and slam as much junk in your system as you can. At least that's the way I used to do it. And uh, it's it's just, it's it's a negative way to go about it. So I would rather have little smaller cheats throughout the week, like two or three times a week. If you crave like a piece of cake, have a piece of cake, you know, big deal. And then move on. Or if, if you want to have like a chocolate bar, have a chocolate bar. Or you want to have a dish of ice cream, have your dish of ice cream. But the more frequently you allow yourself to have these mini cheats, the less you're going to need to satisfy those cravings. And when you don't restrict it, like I know I could eat junk food at any time. Like right? I'm not dieting for anything. There's no restrictions. Like I can go and I could leave this video chat right now and, and head to the drive through and load up on Big Macs, French fries and ice cream. Right. Like I could do that if I want to. So there's no restriction, but I don't want to because eating that stuff makes me feel like crap, makes me look like crap. I would much rather eat healthy. But knowing that I can do it eliminates the temptation almost. Like, I'll give you an example. I know I'm spending a lot of time on this because it's an important topic. If I told you you could never eat pizza again, just, just ponder that. You can never have pizza again. What do you, what's going through your mind? You start wanting pizza, right? Because you're like, what do you mean? I can never have pizza again? But, but I really like pizza. Like, when I say you can't have something, you want it even more. But if I say, you know, you can have it when you want it, but it, it, it then you all of a sudden, you, you well, I don't want it as much. Like, it's, it's, it's a weird phenomenon how, how our brains are wired, right? If, if you try and restrict somebody, like you say, oh, you cannot eat any junk all week long, right? Then they're going to start craving it more and more. And those cravings are going to build up and build up and build up. And then all of a sudden I say, now you can have all the junk you want for this one day from morning to night, eat everything you want. And people are just going to go nuts and start binge eating. And that's where it really creates negative habits. Whereas if you allow like little tiny mini cheats, little cheat meals or cheat snacks throughout the week, it, it creates better habits. And the, the fact that there's no restriction actually reduces those cravings. And what you'll find is once you start eating some of that stuff, especially when you're eating clean and your palate is actually adapted to eating healthy food and you enjoy the healthy food and you feel the benefits of the healthy food, right? You're losing weight, you're getting shape, you feel energy and your digestion is good you start to crave it less and less. So now when I have it, like I had that piece of cake at dad's birthday and like, you know, okay, I had it. It was nice, but I, I, I don't want to do it very often. Right. Because it did, I, I did the little, the momentary pleasure of eating that piece of cake isn't worth the, the, you know, the, the long-term side effects. And now I was thinking also, okay, I got to do like an extra hour of cardio to burn off that cake. I ate like it, it's just when you don't put the restrictions on it, it actually makes it easier to stick to a clean diet. So, Anyway, this is something I could go on and on talking about, but it, it's a big topic for sure. But no, I'm not an addict to cheat days. I'd rather have small little cheat meals spaced out throughout the week. And always do it at the end of another meal. Like, never start with a cheat. Like, don't start with dessert. Always have it for after, right? There's a reason why you, your your mom and dad, right, when you were growing up, they never let you start, start your dinner with cookies and cake. They always say, okay, eat your good food first and then have your dessert after. Because if you fill up on the good stuff first, well, you naturally have less room for the bad stuff after. Right. So take the same, you know, this, this is old stuff. This is old school. Your mom and dad taught you this. They raised you this way. So apply that to your own cheat meals or cheat snacks, whatever you want to call them. Uh, where else? I think, um, I think I missed a question. Okay. Uh, who has the best natural physique ever of all time? I have no idea. I seriously don't. <laughs> I really don't. Uh, there's, there's so many people out there. I, I don't even... I have no idea. I, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. And it also depends on what you're looking at. You're looking at like a bodybuilder physique, you know, or you're looking like at a classic physique or, you know, anyway, I, I, I don't have a, a favorite. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of the golden era of pumping iron bodybuilders because, I mean, that's what kind of like inspired me to start working out back in the day. But, of course, they weren't natural. So I guess that kind of cancels out the question. <laughs> Uh, anyway, next question here. This one's from Axel. Uh, are deep squat? Uh, sorry, no. Are 
are, I think he means drop sets. It's a misspelling there. Are drop sets and other advanced training techniques useful for building muscle? They can be, you know, I mean, it, it's a small piece of the bigger puzzle, like consistency with the training, consistency with the nutrition, consistency with your lifestyle. I mean, that's the big, the big rocks, if you will. Things like drop sets or, or forced reps or whatever, it's, it's, it's minor. I, I'm not... I'm not a big advocate of it because just training to positive muscular failure is intense enough for most people. Like you don't need to, you just need to stimulate the muscle. You don't need to destroy it. Uh, what was it? Lee Haney had a saying like stimulate, don't annihilate, right? You, like you don't need to destroy the muscle to the point where you can't move the next day and make it excessively sore. You just need to train it consistently and progressively. So Positive muscular failure, where you get to the point where you can't do another good repetition, uh, another repetition with good form, like, that's enough, right? You don't need to kill yourself. I mean, if, if you want more stimulation, then I'd rather you take a rest period and then do another set versus uh, trying to, you know, destroy it in one set. Now, with that being said, sometimes I will incorporate some drop sets or some uh, forced reps or whatever. But if I'm going to do them, I usually do them on isolation exercises or machine exercises where it's safe to do so. Like uh, in today's workout, for example, I was doing some uh, tricep pushdowns with the, the cable tricep pushdown. And after I hit momentary failure with the, the weight, I dropped the, the pin on the weight stack. So I dropped it like 20 pounds and then I did a couple more reps and then I dropped it another 20 pounds, did another couple reps just to kind of like give it a little extra pump for the tricep. So, yeah, I mean, that's a drop set. But I, I don't do it for like deadlifts. I wouldn't do it for bench presses or squats because those exercises are too too intense and too demanding. Just straight positive failure with a bench press or, or a squat or a deadlift is intense enough. But sometimes on isolation exercises and machine exercises, I'll, I might throw in a, a drop set if I feel like it. If I got you know a little bit of extra oomph, a little bit of extra piston vinegar in the system, I might uh, do it. But in the greater scheme of things, it's it's a very small like the, the the difference in progress that you're going to see is is like is hardly even measurable because the bigger things you know your consistency your nutrition your sleep your lifestyle like that those are the big things that are going to impact your results not oh did you do a drop set or not right that's that's kind of like you know minuscule uh bobby is tuning in oh I th did i skip one i know no i didn't okay um other exercises for working the traps that one's from lee he says i like doing shrugs uh when working traps can you recommend other exercises farmer's walk is a great exercise for the traps uh that's uh, different rowing exercises like you can do uh, like let's say the upright row is a great one for the traps face pulls another great one for the traps um what are some really good trap exercises? Farmer's walk is, is phenomenal for, for the traps as well. Um, even like, we don't think of them as trap exercises, but anytime like you do like a side lateral raise, like the traps still come into play. Like even you can touch your traps now and you just lift your arms up. Like you can feel your trap muscle contract when you do a side lateral raise. So the traps are coming into play a lot. Uh, another one, this is one you're probably not doing. It's an old school exercise, but it, it's, a, it's a good trap upper back builder. And it's the highs shrug. H-I-S-E, highs shrug. Just do a YouTube search for Lee Hayward, highs shrug. And, and I have a video about it. Bottom line, I'll just give you a quick, I mean, you watch the video and see it and everything else, but it's basically setting up just like you would for a barbell squat, but instead of squatting, you're shrugging the shoulders with the barbell loaded on your back, right? And it's a, it's a old school trap exercise developed by Joseph Curtis Highs back in the 100 years ago. And uh, it, it's, it was just, built, it was a squat assistant exercise to help build up the upper back and, and the strength for squatting, but it's a great upper back trap builder. You can even kind of do a similar exercise with the standing calf raise, you know, the one with the pads on your shoulders, instead of doing calf raises, just literally shrug the pads up while you're doing, uh, while you're on the standing calf raise machine. That's another great trap exercise. This is, this could all be a future, I could make a whole like trap exercise video, all uh, right, but uh, those are some things that you can do for now. I'm going to get ready to clue it up because we've already been going for over an hour. Like when I get into these chats, like I, I love this. If you, if you can't tell by watching this, I actually enjoy what I'm doing here. Like I enjoy having these conversations because I'm passionate about this. And uh, an hour, like uh, this just flies by. It's just like a fart in the wind, right? An hour of video chat is, is probably like the fastest hour of my day. <laughs> Uh, I'm doing this on my phone and my battery is blinking like low, low. So if, if this cuts out, 
before I give you a, a final farewell, don't 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 feel bad. I'm not neglecting you. It's just my battery's blinking here, so I'm gonna have to clue it up very soon anyway. Uh, okay, what else? I'm gonna answer a couple more. Um, says, can you give? This is from Bobby. Can you give me some front lever progression exercises? My goal is to attain a front lever gold for 10 seconds by 2021. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by front lever or front lever gold. I'm, you kind of got me stumped there. That's something I'm not familiar with. So I'm going to have to pass on that one. Uh, how do I increase my bench press? I have a video on YouTube. I or, like just do a search for Lee Hayward bench press on YouTube, and I've got a lot of videos covering some bench press techniques. A lot of them are older videos because back in my older days, that was like a priority of mine. Like I even put a, put out a program called Blast Your Bench, which if you want, you can go check it out. It's on my website, LeeHayward.com. You can go download a copy of Blast Your Bench. Um, that was the bench press specialization program. That was the very first program that I ever launched back in 1997. Uh, that still works. You know, a lot of people think, oh, well, it was 1997. It probably doesn't work anymore. No, the human body has not evolved since 1997 to the point where what worked back then doesn't work today. But that's a great program. But I also have a lot of videos and stuff on bench press. Even go to my blog and just type in, like, go to my blog, hayward.com, and in the search bar, type in bench press. And there's a lot of articles and, and workouts there to help with that. Uh, what else we got? What are your thoughts on ammonia smelling salts? Does it help for reaching a new PR? Have you ever tried it? That's from Wargup. Warg or Warg Pup. Um, I have tried it just to, 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 to try it, but I've never actually utilized it in the gym. Like I've sniffed ammonia before just to kind of like, what the heck is this stuff? And I like, oh man, this is, ugh. but no, I've never actually used it in the gym. So I, I don't have any uh, comments about, it. I would just focus. I, I had a different type of focus when I was getting ready for, for like a, a max effort lift. I, I find I actually perform better with, with like a quiet, concentrated focus. Like I know some people like to shout and rant and roar and try and like rawr, and get their adrenaline all pumped up and all that kind of stuff. I kind of like have this just like kind of center myself and quiet in my mind and just like visualize myself successfully doing the weight. And yes, I would s still kind of like get myself a little bit amped up, but I wouldn't go like pacing back and forth or beating my head against the wall or have people slap you across the face and all that foolishness. Like, I, I, I perform better when I have that just a quiet, concentrated focus. That's when I perform my best with with anything that requires like concentrated effort. Uh, Woodyulos is joining in. Hey, how's it going, Stogie? Stogie's a hardcore follower. I mean, Stogie, keep an eye on your mail, my friend. I've sent you, I sent you a present in the mail, and it should have. Well, it's coming from North America now, so it'll probably take a week or two to get there. But I have, I have a present in the mail for you, Stogie. It's coming your way. Something to look forward to. <laughs> Shh, something. It's a special gift. Per personal coaching students get special gifts from Lee Hayward in the mail. So if, if that's an incentive, if you want to get special gifts in the mail from Lee Hayward, become a personal coaching student. Uh, Ricky's tuning in. Uh, I have had, a, I've just had a tooth out. Just want to know if it's still okay to work out. If you feel okay and you're not bleeding, I guess it is. I mean, that's something you're going to have to like basically judge it by yourself. Um, as, like I said, as long as you're, you're not like bleeding uncontrollably, blood out of your mouth or whatever, I mean, you should be able to work out. Obviously, use your own discretion on that one. I remember several years back, this is a lot of years back now, like almost 20 years ago, um, yeah, I had my wisdom teeth taken out, all four of them, right? And my bottom jaw, like, swole up, like, out to here. And I'm, I'm not really exaggerating that much. Like, it was boom, right way out. And I had an like, egg-shaped head because the jaw was wider than the top of my head. And, like, I was bleeding for days. Like, I had cotton swabs in my mouth there where the wisdom teeth were. And, like, I wouldn't be going to the gym at that stage, obviously. But, I mean, if it's just, if, if it's not that intrusive and you don't feel bad or you're not pumped up on painkillers, then, yeah, you should be able to work out. But use your own discretion. 
We have Jesse tuning in from Texas. Miss Videos tuning in. Who else is tuning in? Brent is joining in. Varun or Varan. I don't know how to pronounce your name, but you're, you're tuning in. <laughs> can I do pull-ups with my... Well, sorry. Can I do pull-ups while my weight is in optimum range according to my height i'm reasonably good shape and i don't know what it is i'm not doing right oh sorry i can't do pull-ups just because you're not strong enough that's as simple as that i mean i not not to be rude or mean or it's just it's true i mean just because your height to weight ratio or whatever like if pull-ups are a hard exercise like the average person cannot do a pull-up even a lot of people who work out regularly still can't do pull-ups. Like, pull-ups are an advanced exercise. So it's one that you're going to just kind of build up your strength to. Now, if you want help with that, I have videos on YouTube. Just do a search for Lee Hayward Pull-Up, and you will see videos that actually explain how to do pull-ups for beginners, uh, some assistant exercises. A lot of gyms these days have a machine that's like an assisted pull-up machine where you can actually reduce some of your body weight while you're doing pull-ups, and you can also build up your strength just with lat pull-downs. Uh, but bottom line, you just got to get stronger. You're, you're not strong enough yet to do a pull-up. Simple as that. So check out those videos. Lee Hayward pull-up. Just do a search on YouTube right now, right? Go there and you'll see some of the videos that I posted. Uh, how do you boost your immune system naturally? And diet is huge, right? Don't put crap in your body. Don't put low quality processed foods in. Natural unprocessed foods be a huge one. Lots of fruits and vegetables, like get those natural enzymes and antioxidants, fruits, vegetables, berries, all that good stuff in your diet. Uh, avoid alcohol, uh, sleep, eight hours of sleep a night, drink plenty of water, get, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's a great way to boost your immune system naturally. Washing your hands, keeping good personal hygiene. I mean, the little things, it's all, all the little things, like it's, it's not the big things. Like a lot of people are looking for this big magic thing thing it's all the little things added up that's where the results come from that applies to pretty much everything like it's your fitness and 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 you know relationships and business and everything it's it's not this one big grand thing it's all the little things that some people take for granted but it's doing all those little things consistently day in day out week in week out year in year out that add up to big massive change over time we have Jacob's tuning in. How's it going, my friend? We have RC tuning in. Who else we got tuning in? Uh, X Snowman is tuning in. He says, I have a friend that exercises, but he isn't ripped, but he is a strong... Uh, sorry. I have a friend. I hope you do. <laughs> I hope you have more than one. Uh, I have a friend that exercises, but he isn't ripped. He is strong. Uh, how is that possible? That's a lot of people are big and strong, but not ripped. Like that's actually, there's probably more people who are strong than there are people who are ripped. Ripped really comes down to, you know, diet and, and, and cardio and burning the fat. Strong is, you know, just eat big and lift big for, for, I mean, I, I'm simplifying it big time here, but there's more big and strong guys out there than there are lean and shredded ripped guys because a lot of people actually enjoy eating big and lifting big but they don't enjoy the i guess the the work that goes into eating clean and losing body fat of course unless you're just naturally genetically built that way but that's how is that possible that's very common that's not that's not abnormal whatsoever um we have I can't even pronounce your name, but thanks for tuning in. You, 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 Ryle, I think it is. And then we have Prince 51. It says, fastest way for progressive overload. Increase the weight you're lifting or do more repetitions. That's a pretty fast way to do progressive overload. Um, how do you get to two plates a bench? I am 25 years old. You increase it by a little bit at a time. Like I mentioned before, whatever you're benching now, try to add five pounds to the bar. Get good at that. Once you can do that, add five more. Once you get good at that, add five more. <laughs> and just keep going. And eventually, all those little five-pound jumps, one of these days is going to add up to 225 pounds. Like, ser seriously, I know I'm simplifying it, but that's basically the, the process. It's just slow, steady, consistent progress over time. Now, if you would like some more help with that, head on over to LeeHayward.com and download a copy of Blaster Bench. 
Like that's that goes into a lot of detail, and it's not just it gives you a training program to follow. That's a bench press specialization program, but it really dials into technique and and like the technique is huge because most guys like I, I could take the average person in the gym and probably have them set a new personal record in the bench press, like in a single workout by just fixing their technique, right? Like once you master the technique, uh, you, you not only are you going to lift heavier, you're also going to reduce your risk of injury and you're going to feel more solid under the weight as well. So the blaster bench program will really dive into that, the training the technique. And of course it also has a nutrition plan that you can follow along with that. Uh, what else we got? I'm going to clue it up, guys. We've gone an hour and 15 minutes, so I'll probably just... Who else we have? Johan tuning in from Sweden. Hey, welcome, my friend. Um, is a mile enough for cardio? Uh, well, what's enough, right? Like, it all, like, how much is enough? It's like saying, how long is a piece of string, right? How much is enough? How much money is enough? How much is too much? Like, it's it's all relative to you, your goals, and what it is you're trying to achieve, right? Like, a mile is better than no miles, but, I mean, obviously, if, if your goal is fat loss and burning calories, you know, you, the more you do, the better. But it's it really depends on your goals and situations. So just to kind of recap, like for those of you who are tuned in right now, like if you need some help with this, I mean, like obviously I'm throwing out some answers to some questions here, but we're only like scratching the surface. Like obviously if, if you would like some actual help with, uh, you know, coming up with a, a training and nutrition and action plan that works for you, your lifestyle, your situation, your goals and all that, then, hey, feel free to email me. And, and what we can do is we can discuss an action plan. And if you would like some help with it, you know, we can even brainstorm some ideas. Like I offer coaching calls where we can actually get on the phone and brainstorm some ideas and come up with a realistic action plan for you. And if, if it's something you would like to pursue, then we can discuss the possibility of, of coming on board as one of my uh, coaching students. And when you come on board with a coaching student, like I follow along with your progress in real time. And we have these ongoing coaching calls on a regular basis to help you stay on track, to keep you accountable and moving in the right direction towards reaching your goal. So if that's something you're interested in, like if, if you're sick and tired of like spinning your wheels and you're like, you've been doing this and you're not getting the results you want and you actually want to see some progress for the time and effort you're spending in the gym and you need some help, then hey, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to have a chat with you and we can discuss a realistic action plan. And if you don't want that and you just want to keep spinning your wheels and doing it on your own, that's fine as well. Right? I'm not trying to force anybody to do something they don't want to do, but if you would like some help, I mean... If you're here, you're watching, you're typing questions, you probably do want some help or you wouldn't even be here. Just kind of throw that out there. If you would like some help, shoot me an email, right? It's actually me who responds to those emails. It's not some robot or anything like that. I actually respond to the emails and we can chat about whatever whatever's challenging you. All right, who else we got? We got David's tuning in. We've got Ricky. We've got Mad Evils. <laughs> uh, da -da -da -da. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Please keep uploading. Greetings from Morocco. That's from a same or a same, I think it is. Uh, David's saying thanks. Uh, looking good, sir. Appreciate it. Hope I am looking good. Getting all right. Getting older. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and do the best I can. All right. One more question here. Um, talk about how soreness indicates the amount of weekly volume a person should do. It's it's not necessarily correlated to that I, I discussed soreness earlier in the video so if, if you actually want to rewind back or watch the replay i think it might have been one of the first questions i answered was talking about muscle soreness but muscle soreness doesn't correlate to progress in the gym right like it, it usually correlates to your body's conditioning the, the worse shape you're in the more soreness you're going to experience the better shape you're in the less soreness you're going to experience like someone who's advanced with their workouts and training regularly, they're going to experience not a lot of soreness. Like I rarely get sore after a workout anymore. And if I do, it's it's not a lot of soreness. It's usually gone within a day or two. Whereas someone who's new and, and like, you know, like they start working out and all of a sudden like, like they're beat up, they're sore, they can't move the next day. That's because their, their body is so deconditioned and so unaccustomed to the exercise that it's a total shocker to the system. But the better shape you're in physically, the more you're going to be able to handle and the less soreness you're going to be experiencing. So it doesn't necessarily correlate to volume because you could take someone who's brand new and have them do a low volume workup and they could get painfully sore. 
you can have someone who's experienced and they might do a high volume workout and not even feel it the next day. So it's, it, it doesn't, there's not a direct correlation there. Um, tips for a soon to be father fitness or life wise. Oh my God. That's a video in and of itself. I'm trying to clue it up here guys. And that's a video in and of itself. Don't neglect your family. <laughs> that's one thing. Health and fitness is important, yes, but you need to make time for your family there as well. But at the same time, you have to you have to schedule in time to look after yourself. And, and this is this is actually a good topic. I'm going to finish off on this one and then clue it up for the day. A lot of guys, I, I see this with with a lot of the the men that I coach personally, and this is the reason they they came to me is because this is the situation they find themselves in. They're family men, working men. And they're spending all their time and energy and effort providing for their family, which is good. I mean, hey, you should do that. You're the man of the house. You should provide for your family. But then they're doing so and they're sacrificing their own health in the process. And that is not a smart move. Because if if you go and you give like you're, you're dedicating all this time and effort to your career, that your, your job, your career, whatever. So you're spending a lot of time and energy there. And then, of course, you're spending a lot of time and energy you know, taking care of things at home, you're the breadwinner, you're the provider, but then you're neglecting your own health and fitness, what's going to happen is your performance in everything else that you do is going to start to suffer. And when that starts to suffer, then you're not going to be able to be the provider that you want to be, right? It's going to have a negative impact. Your, your energy's level is going to go down. Your confidence is going to go down. Your health is going to start to suffer. You're just not going to have the stamina, the energy, uh, the vitality, the mobility, whatever, to do what you need to do. Like, and, and sometimes when it gets really, really bad, I'm talking like when people start to get, you know, so uh, overweight and out of shape that it affects their, their health and their performance and their mobility, like to the point where you can't even keep up with your kids anymore. Like your kids want to go outside and play and you can't because you're too fat D and you don't have the energy to go out and play with your kids, right? Or, or, or like you can't, you're dragging your ass through a day at work because you don't have the energy you know, or you're not sleeping well because you're so overweight and, and that, you know, you might have sleep apnea issues and everything else. Like it, all this kind of stuff compounds. So you have to make time for yourself as well. I know it seems selfish at first, like, hey, take time out of my schedule from providing for my family to look after me. But you have to take that to, it's like th that me time so that you can be the best version of yourself. So then you have the best version of you to give to others. Because if you don't do that, then what's going to happen is you're going to start to break down. And then once you start to break down, then you can't provide the way that you want to. And I'll give you an analogy. Like imagine trying to get ahead by ignoring the maintenance on your car, right? So you're driving your car, right? And you're, you're every day, you're driving your car, you're driving your car. And then all of a sudden the check engine light comes on. You say, oh, I, I'll worry about that later, right? I don't have time. I, I'm too busy. I got I to gotta do things. I still got to drive the car. I still got to do it. So then you're driving, then all of a sudden, you know, the brakes start to squeal, right? That doesn't matter, right? I'm too busy. I, I haven't got time to stop and check the engine, check the brakes, nothing like that. Then it starts burning oil and smoke coming out the back of it. Nah, too busy. Can't do it. I still had to go. Still had to go. Well, like all of these are warning signs and we're getting warning signs all the time. Like if you're overweight, that's a warning sign, right? You go to your doctor. He says, hey, you got high blood pressure. You got high cholesterol, right? You're, you're whatever, right? You, you, your sex drive starts to dwindle. Your energy plummets. Like these are all like check engine lights on your own body saying, hey, something's wrong here. Hey, wake up, wake up. We're giving you warning signs. You need to fix this. But so many people don't. And then they just keep ignoring all these warning signs and they ignore them and they ignore them. And then they start stacking up, stacking up, stacking up, just like with your car. Like if you start to ignore all the general maintenance, it starts to stack up. And then eventually that car is going to crap out and die. So you're going to be driving down the road and things are just going to be gone, right? Piece of shit, right? The car is just craps out, dies. Whereas if you had kept up on the maintenance, that car could have probably lasted you for years. But now that you've neglected the maintenance, like let's just say you've never ever checked the oil on your car. And you keep driving, you keep driving it. And then one of these days, the oil's bone dry and the, the engine just comes to a grinding halt. See solid, no oil in the engine, right? What was a perfectly good engine, if you had it just kept up on general maintenance, checking the oil and changing the oil, you could have had that car for years and gotten hundreds of thousands of kilometers on the car. Now you have the thing, it's it's a piece of crap and it's, it, it's dead, right? Now, if it's a car, it's not such a big deal because you can always go and get another car. If it's your body... That you have one body. You don't you don't get a second chance, right? You can't hit the reset button, right? If you 
drop dead of a heart attack. It's not like, oh, I can get another body and keep going. No, you drop dead of a heart attack. Guess what? You're dead. You're over. You're out. <laughs> right? So you need to take care of yourself. And this is a big, big lesson that it's so simple. Like when I'm telling you this, like it makes sense. Oh, yeah, I understand it. But so many people, there's people watching this channel right now. Like you, you watching this right now. You're doing this yourself. Like you're overweight, you're out of shape, and you're like, I've been ignoring the check engine light on my body for years, right? I'm overweight. I have low energy. I, I you know, the doctor says I should lose weight. I got high blood pressure. I got high cholesterol. Like all this stuff is starting to compound. And you're just like ignoring the warning signs, ignoring the warning signs. And then eventually, you know what? You're eventually you're going to run out of warnings and it's just going to all over. And then if you have a family who's relying on you, because this was the question, how to be, you know, tips for, for a family man. If your family are relying on you and you can't do the basic functions, like your body doesn't work anymore. Like, if, of course, if you drop dead of a heart attack, well, then you're not, no good to anybody. But even if you just get sick, like, imagine you get to the point where you can't go to work anymore. Or maybe you develop type 2 diabetes, and then it starts to develop to the point where now you have to get your toes amputated, and then your foot amputated, and then your leg amputated, because your body's just deteriorating. Now your eyesight goes. Like diabetes is a nasty, nasty disease, and I've like it's, it sounds gross and everything else, but I've I've witnessed family members go through this, right? Like I've seen them to the point where their toes literally turn black and start to rot, and they amputate the toes, and then the next thing you know, their foot turns black and starts to rot, and they amputate the foot, and then it's off at the knee, and their eyes like they're going blind. Like if you're in that situation, like you're no, you can't even take care of yourself, let alone take care of a family. So like, don't let yourself get to that point right? Have some self-respect to look after your health and fitness, right? Go to the freaking gym a few times a week. Eat clean. Like, is is eating crap worth that? Like, is the momentary pleasure you get from eating all that crap worth all the, the negative side effects? No, because I mean, most of the time you eat the crap and like you're burping and farting and getting